Good morning, and welcome from the Arkansas Oklahoma Synod Assembly here in Tulsa. This weekend we've been spending our time talking about and celebrating and, and learning about the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, learning and growing together and worshiping together. And we hope that you've been praying for us as we've been praying for you as we have gathered together here in assembly as the Arkansas Oklahoma Synod. Good to be with you on this fourth Sunday of Easter as we spend some time together thinking about today's uh, gospel lesson. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you promise us abundant life. Help us, O oh Lord, to live in that life and through that life in our congregations and in all that we say and do as your people in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. It's hard to believe that it has been six years since you elected me as your bishop. The time has gone amazingly fast. And I can tell you that over these six years, I have learned and I have grown, and a lot of that has to do with just being with you. We have had a lot of great experiences together. We've been through a lot uh, together as congregations and as a synod. Did you know that over the past six years, we have walked together and transitioned with each other through call processes now almost 25 times. We've learned a lot together in terms of all of that. Over the past six years, we have walked together through times of conflict and challenge and worked through those things. We've been together in times of joy and of celebration as we've come together and worshiped together and rejoiced and praised God together. And I thank you for that opportunity. I have been blessed in so many ways by you and by the Synod as we have gathered together and experienced so much. One of the absolute favorite things of my work as a bishop is my ministry among you as bishop is being with you, particularly on Sunday mornings in worship. I love to come and worship with your congregations and then to be with you in your fellowship hall and classrooms or maybe just out in the parking lot to hear how things are going what's happening and what challenges you're facing as a congregation and to think together and talk together about how we together can meet the challenges of being in mission and in ministry in this time and in this place because we know these are challenging times to be the church i don't have to tell you i think most of you if not all of you know for many of the mainline churches and particularly for the lutheran church this has been a period of decline some of you have experienced that very, very directly. It's been a time when our churches have been growing smaller and older. And for a lot of us, that's a time that, or an experience that generates a lot of anxiety and uncertainty as we think about the future. And as we look around the world, uh, look at the world around us, we see all sorts of challenges. Do you know what the fastest growing religious group in this country is? It's not the mega church down the block. It's not the non-denominational churches. It's not even another religion like Islam. We're told that the fastest growing religious group in the United States right now are the so-called nuns. That's N-O-N-E-S. That is, those people who say that they are spiritual but not religious. People who believe that they can reach out and connect with the divine without the uh, need for organized religion. We need to take all these trends seriously as a church. We need to be, pay attention to what they mean for how we do mission and ministry together as a church. It used to be, I think, a time long ago where you could put a sign outside in front of your church that said worship service at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever, and people would just come. They would just come to you looking for an opportunity to gather together and worship. But you know as well as I that those days are long gone. And even though we yearn for things to be the way they used to be, we know in our hearts that that's not likely that that day and that age is going to come back, at least not any day soon. And so, so often we sit in our churches and wonder why people don't come. We sit in our churches and we grieve. We grieve deeply this sense that we've lost this past that we remember so fondly. We sit together, we sit together and wonder what's going to happen and hope that our churches might just survive a little longer 
or as some people have told me, actually a number of people have told me, I just hope my church survives long enough to do my funeral. It's bleak. That's a bleak perspective. But I don't think, I don't think it's what Jesus intends for us. I know that sometimes it feels like what Jesus says in our gospel lesson is true, that the thieves and the bandits have scaled the walls of our sanctuaries and come among us to kill and destroy. It feels like the sheep have been stolen from our pews. But nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the New Testament do I read that Jesus says, just hang along as long as he can and hope for the best. No, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, I have come to give you life. I have come to give you abundant life. But do we believe it? Do we really believe it? Do we believe that Jesus has come to give us abundant life? Do we, like Mary and Martha, who were mourning for their brother Lazarus at the tomb, where he'd been laid for three days, are we able, like them, to come to our Lord and say, we believe, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life, and that you are the resurrection and the life for us? Do we believe it? My brothers and sisters, do we believe do we believe that God is calling us today to leave our sheep pens? That Jesus is leading us out into the world in mission and in ministry, in service and in witness? Do we believe that our Lord Jesus is still leading us out as sheep, out of the walls of our sheep pens and out into the world, out beyond, we've always done it that way before, and into a new day and a new time as God's people, the church? You see, my brothers and sisters, what we need is a new reformation. What we need is a renovation. Figuratively speaking, the churches that we love so much need a little bit more than just some paint to dress them up to make them more attractive to the people in the world. No, we need a renovation. We need to knock down some walls. We need to widen some doors. We need to replace the plumbing and the electric and the heating and the air conditioning. We need an overhaul as a church. And yet so often, yet so often we say, but we don't have the resources to do that. We don't have the energy. We don't have the ability. We don't know how to do that. We don't have the money. We don't have the time. But my brothers and sisters, we have the greatest resource at all of all time on our side. We have the Good Shepherd. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the love and grace of Jesus to walk with us. And we have a God who is a God of the impossible. We have a God who even raised Jesus from the dead. But do we believe it? Do we believe it? Our Lord God walks with us and calls us and goes out before us. Our Lord Jesus leads us out of the sheep pen and into the world in service and witness. Our Lord Jesus leads us out and has already gone ahead of us to prepare the way. Our Lord Jesus has promised to be with us to the close of the age. Yes, our Lord Jesus comes to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. And this is not just a promise for when we die, that we'll get abundant life when we go to heaven. No, it is a promise and a gift for the here and the now. One of the great blessings that I have as I serve as your bishop is that I get to be in your congregations and regularly see all of the ministry and the mission that you do. I regularly get to see how you have touched the lives of countless people with the love and grace of Jesus Christ, with compassion, with mercy, and with care. It is true that every one of the churches in the Arkansas, Oklahoma Synod, from St. Thomas in Anadarko, which is our smallest, to Fellowship Lutheran in Tulsa, which is our largest, 
Every single congregation in our synod is in some way involved in serving the communities where they find themselves through food pantries and clothing programs and meal programs and in lots and lots of other ways. To me, that is a sign of the abundant life that Jesus promises us. Did you know that every one of our congregations from Derizet, Texas on the west all the way over to Jonesboro, Arkansas on the east, every one of our congregation cares for the sick, reaches out to the lonely, visits those who are in need, surrounds families who have lost loved ones and who are grieving. Every congregation takes care of those who come to them with needs. In fact, even the congregations that are sometimes a little torn up with conflict and struggle will take time and set those conflicts apart to take care of a member or even a visitor who is in need. I've seen it. And that's a sign, that's a sign of the abundant life that Jesus promises us. And individual Christians are out there, sometimes in spite of themselves, doing the work of the gospel. Individual Christians are out there who care deeply, who care deeply in spite of the fact that sometimes, you know, we sin all over each other. Individual Christians are out there. They are out there doing the work, expressing God's love and compassion and grace, even though so often we are so covered with the dross of human perfection that it seems to get in the way. Our congregations are about the business of proclaiming the gospel. We are, in fact, proclaiming the gospel sometimes in spite of ourselves. And that's a sign. That's a sign of God's abundant life at work in and through us. And yes, God is using us, you and me, in spite of our sin and our imperfections and our short-sightedness and our narrow-mindedness, in spite of our manipulation of one another, in spite of the fact that sometimes we're not all that graceful as God's people, the church. And yet somehow God uses us to get the job done. And that is a sign. That is a sign of the abundant life that Jesus promises us. Yes, I know. We sheep can be pretty stupid sometimes. It's true. Sometimes we make terrible mistakes. Sometimes we really do go the wrong way. But our Lord God promises to be with us. And in fact, from the very beginning of the time, God has managed to work. In fact, God is a specialist in working with people just like us. Just like us. With all our flaws and imperfections. In order that God's word might be proclaimed. In order that the world might be served. In order that people might experience God's care and compassion and forgiveness and God's mercy. And so my prayer this day is that God might continue to bless the Arkansas-Oklahoma Synod, that my God might continue to bless the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, that God might continue to bless the whole Church of Jesus Christ in all its many, many varieties, and that God might continue to work through in and through us, to continue to lead us as his sheep out into the world, so that we might continue to do God's work with our hands, that we might continue to praise God with our voices, and that we might share God's grace boldly with everyone. In Jesus' name.